session is going to focus on um, how how does your garden grow? Um, how do you monitor? What do you watch for to keep your vegetables uh, healthy? And that's what I'll be talking about. And then Michael will follow with uh, uh, some tips on watering, uh, how to how to make watering work well. <laughs> And Allison will be talking about the insect pests of the day. And then after that, we'll have questions. So, okay, this is my idea of how best to keep your monitoring on a schedule, sort of. Um, just do uh, a morning patrol every day. I mean, it's kind of fun anyway. Sometimes you don't see much growing, but it's just, just to go around and see how things are doing. Now, my, I don't have to monitor a whole lot because I, right now, they're in a little greenhouse thing and most of them will end up on the deck or in pots somewhere. I <coughs> have given up um, for deer. But uh, one of the things you do, you would do is to check for the soil moisture because of, um, it's very important to keep that even. Uh, and you could, once they get a few more leaves, remove the dead uh, leaves or even plants when one fails altogether or gets disease, it's best just to remove it and, re and replace it or just give the others a little more space. And also just check on the growth. Sometimes, uh, you know, while they're getting their roots, they don't do a whole lot of growing, but later on they should be and the sun, and you're getting more sunlight and more warmth, they should be growing well. And so if they're not, maybe you need to do, maybe there's a little feeding that could, could help. Um, maybe they're too close together. You just couldn't give up all of them and you, and it said to thin them out and you didn't. Well, that will end up biting you in the, in the end. Uh, you, you just need to thin them out and maybe you'll notice that there are weeds there and to get the weeds while they're small and away keep them away from the vegetables is a really good idea next slide okay preventing a problem is easier than curing it i know that from experience <laughs> um young plants which most mostly what we have going right now are more vulnerable to stressors and stressors are just anything that limits plant growth and production. Um, the as they get bigger and have, they're well-rooted and they get sturdier, they will be less vulnerable, but always there's something ready to pounce on them. Um, abiotic stressors uh, is one, there are two types of stressors. I mean, they're categories, categorized into two different types. Abiotic stressors are those that are not caused by living organisms, <clears throat> such as like high heat or cold, as we just had, uh, drought or excessive moisture watering, uh, poor soil conditions, you know, heavy clay, just not, not loose enough to no air spaces, and lack of the essential minerals, which is kind of hard to tell without a soil test, but you will notice it in the plant's growth. Next. Okay, about water. Now, Michael's going to talk more about this, and his is more thorough, but um, consistent watering is going to be the key to survival. Um, the reason is mainly that water carries the nutrients from the soil, and it keeps the plant tissues perfused and sturdy. Um, otherwise they will be wilting and it's very hard to bring back a super wilted young plant. Um, so Mike will be talking about that later. And sunlight, we all want to grow vegetables. They, they do need the right spot. And my best spot would be in the driveway in the front, but that's inconvenient. So the reason you need the light, the sunlight is, well, most of you know this, uh, that's the way the plant, uh, it needs light for photosynthesis. So if it doesn't get the light it needs, it will not be able to make as much 
uh, glucose as it needs to grow well. Uh, and it may end up being really leggy and weak, and in that case, more susceptible to disease and insect damage. Next. Okay. Um, hmm, this is a little late. I don't know if we're still in for this, but um, still a chance for cold weather now. Um, a lot of people don't even put out their plants in the ground yet unless they have a way to cover them. Uh, like row covers or uh, some other way of protecting them when they're out early. But this is one thing I do. This also helps with deer. You just put those boxes that lettuce and tomatoes and things, mushrooms come in and stick um, stakes through them until the, they are sort of um, more established. But um, for emergencies like we had last weekend, um, tree trimmings, leaves, cardboard boxes, old sheets, um, upside down pots. I use my garbage cans over some things um, just to keep them from have, getting uh, the tips frozen or even the whole plant. All right, next slide. Um, windy weather is also something that can dry out your plants. That's one reason why we try to harden them off out of the wind. Um, but the wind can still be a factor for wilting during the early, um, the, the, when the vegetable plants are really young, especially if they're in an exposed area. So you can also protect them in some, some way, uh, just like for cold, or maybe there's a, you could put up a little break, a little screen break. Um, seedlings that were not given time to harden off. I think everybody knows what that means. Uh, just get them used to outdoor conditions gradually. Not they they can't just go out right away. They'll well they'll wilt for one thing and be pretty much finished off. But if you gradually get them used to a little wind, a little sun, and a little um, <clears throat> heat, they are cold. They'll uh, they'll do better. Okay, and they would be the ones that needed the most protection. Okay, biotic stressors is the other half of the picture of the problems that we have for our vegetables. Um, and it is a little harder to monitor for pests and diseases, and it's really hard to identify them because a lot of them uh, look alike, and a lot of them look like some of the abiotic stressors, and you might get those confused too. Um, what you, the most important thing you can know is what does the normal, what does the plant look like at its best? What's the normal appearance of the plant? Um, Another thing, you, you might be familiar with it already, but you could find out uh, there are a lot of good sources that can tell you what are the pests uh, and diseases that it's just, the plant is susceptible to. Um, and when, the dates, when those things are likely to occur. And then what are the symptoms? The symptoms are what it looks like, what, what changed it on the plant that you can say something's wrong with this plant. Uh, it looks different. It's getting yellow, it's drooping, uh, it has holes in it. Um, those are all basically symptoms, something you can see um, that gets you, uh, sort of notifies you that you need to find out what the what is happening. Um, one good thing to that you can do is keep a record. If you grow that plant every year, um, what did it have? What problems did you have last year with it? Uh, because that's probably gonna happen again. Like, I mean, so I don't know how they find them, but those, the moths that lay the squash bore egg, um, legs that, that end up finishing off your squashes. I don't know, they find them on your deck even. So um, if you had that problem last year, it's, it's probably gonna happen again. So be ready. All right, next slide. <clears throat> okay, so the symptoms are 
the yellowing holes and spots on the leaves are some kind of symptoms. But uh, the signs are the actual evidence of the specific pest or pathogen that is causing the symptoms. So um, one thing maybe, that, that's why I say look under the leaves, the egg masses are most often gonna be under the leaves. Um, gray or white fuzzy mold, we've all seen that <laughs> on the leaves and the stems. Um, honeydew, it, if you notice the sticky, well, right now most of the honeydew from last year will be black because it will have the, the what is it called? Black, uh, black mold, but that will, that will actually go off. But the, the cause of it will probably still be there, like scale or aphids. Um, slimy trails on the ground <clears throat> and plants. Allison's gonna talk about some of those things. Um, this picture, I put it on here because it's when I took on my tomatoes. Um, I, I bet most people could identify it, but it, the insect, but why does it have those white things on it? It happens that this is a tomato hornworm that um, a parasitic wasp has laid eggs on and those eggs are going to eventually just uh, suck all the juice out of the uh, out of the hornworm, and so I just let I thought it was horrible looking when I saw it, but then I said, "Oops, I remember something from class," and left it there. And sure enough, there were two of them, and they both had the eggs on them, and they were just shriveled up to nothing. So that's a beneficial insect that you do not. It's a dilemma. It was a huge tomato plant, so it wasn't going to eat at all. But um, it's best. I think it's best to leave those. So, next slide. <clears throat> these these are some other. I, I want people to be aware that uh, that insects. There are some beneficial insects that we need to be aware of and and protect. Um, this, of course, this mantis, I magnified him hugely. He was small, peeking at me. Um, those ha lay eggs in a little gooey looking brown thing on your, on the sturdy stem of a plant. And I trimmed it off once thinking it was a disease, but uh, then I found out it was a mantis egg case. And uh, so leave those. <clears throat> and these uh, white things on the, Japanese maple tree are the eggs of the green lacewings, which are also beneficial insects. So sometimes you, before you kill an insect, I think it's really good to find out whether it's a beneficial. Um, so, um, okay, so preventing diseases though, uh, proper watering, which Mike's gonna talk about, cleaning up the debris around the plants and adding clean mulch. Hygiene is really like num number one uh, for, for, taking, for making your garden less susceptible to disease. Uh, keeping the weeds out. The weeds not only sometimes host insects and disease, they also use up some of the nutrients and water. So um, some of the, I haven't ever done this, row covers on the plants, um, that are susceptible to stem borers before the, have them undercover until those um, stem borer lay, laying insects come. And though I think they only have one, uh, one, what do you call it? One crop of <laughs> eggs. They only lay eggs once, one generation, and they, you would prevent them from even laying their eggs. And handpicking just to keep the keep the population down, so they won't you won't have a huge un, number of uh, of them. Okay, and I already mentioned the beneficials. Next slide. Okay, keeping a log. Now, I think this is a wonderful idea, and I tell myself every year it is, but I haven't done a thing about it. So I'm suggesting that one, there's so much information on the uh, seed packet that would be good to keep. 
And then other things you might want to keep track of would be um, when you put the, when you put the seeds on um, when you sowed the seeds when they sprouted how long it took um, when you transplanted them um, and then maybe the pests that are could be bother could affect them in the in the future. Okay, next. And then I was looking for garden journals and there are lots that you can download. I, this one, you could, you will see it on, uh, if you look for garden, free garden journals to download, the, this one will be in there with the watercolor looking background. Um, and then I saw online, there are lots of them that have year to year uh, places where you keep your information. It would be really good uh, way to get organized and a great addition to your gardening practice. And I plan again to do it this year. Okay, uh, now I, I'm, okay, these are my sources. This is a wonderful book, Ira Wallace's book on vegetables. It goes month by month and it's very practical information and not too detailed. Um, we have our Master Gardener Handbook, which is excellent for vegetables, and our Pest Management Guide. And this source, the Maine, University of Maine um, Extension, Cooperative Extension, has pictures of lots of insects and lots of diseases. It's a pretty good, once you get to the extension, it's a pretty easy to navigate the, the um, website. So now our next presenter is Mike, who's going to tell you all about watering. In the spring, you don't have to do too much watering just yet. But already next week, we're talking about 80 degree weather. So get ready to water. Um, picture on the left, of course, is what you want to produce. And the picture on the right, uh, is uh, obviously these are peppers and uh, it comes uh, from inconsistent watering. Uh, this is called, uh, it's called blossom end rot. So you kind of overwater, then you underwater and you try to keep compensating and this is what comes out in the balance. Uh, so or what can come out in the balance. So just a few words about when to water, how much, and then some do's and don'ts. So next slide, please. Um, best, people say, in the AM, uh, it is uh, uh, the, of course, the worst time to do it is in the heat of the day, which I always used to do because I didn't know anything and I would see plants drooping and so you water them and, of course, that's not a good thing because uh, the sun, it, it's inefficient, the water evaporates. Uh, plus, you know, water beads, if they collect on the plant, can magnify sunlight and actually burn the leaves. Um, watering at night is not a good idea either if you can avoid it because um, it encourages disease. Uh, a lot of the funguses, uh, you know, if the water stays on the plant and that sort of thing, uh, it um, encourages fungus and once the plant has a fungus, it, it is weakened and pests like nothing better than a weakened plant. Um, set a regular day to water each week. Um, I, uh, I, I need to do that because I can never remember whether I watered on Thursday or Saturday. So um, just pick a day and uh, be regular about it. Um, in terms of quantity of water, if you've just put seeds in the ground, it's good to keep the soil moist, uh, which may mean in the heat of the summer watering every one or two days. Uh, you can check the, you know, the couple of inches into the soil with your finger and see if it's moist after germination. Uh, it's important to water only once or maybe twice a week in, uh, in the heat, uh, not in the heat of the summer, but I mean in, at, at the time when it's hot um, uh, during August and July. Um, one to two inches is what people recommended, recommend, and when I say one to two inches, that's the cumulative rain plus what you might water. So altogether one inch, altogether two inches. Uh, the uh, people say water less often for longer du duration because um, you want to soak the root ball of the 
plant, particularly newer plants, uh, need more water. And flowers and fruits need more water than leafy greens. Next slide, please. This is the opposite way, too much watering. Um, some dews, uh, as Karen already said, weed diligently, weeds compete uh, aggressively for water in the soil. Um, <clears throat> water the soil, not the leaves. Uh, once again, to hit that root ball. Um, research, if you can, research critical watering periods for vegetables. Um, the, um, uh, there are guides for these things, and I, I do have something from the Farmer's Almanac in here that tells a little bit about how much and when to water and what, what kinds of vegetables and plants need more water. Um, use a, they call it a shower head nozzle rather than a pistol grip. Uh, the pistol grip, of course, is great if you're trying to put out a fire, but uh, you, can you can also knock down the plant. Um, and then uh, I use a bit of drip irrigation myself. Uh, I find it works very well. It's very efficient. Uh, the water goes right to the individual plant, and um, you can tell it's time to <clears throat> you can tell it's time to uh, to move on with the uh, irrigation, the drip irrigation when the when the water accumulates and uh, it's just not going into the soil as well. Um, some of the, and, and mulching is very important. Uh, it contains moisture and, and helps to defeat weeds, uh, keeps the weeds down a bit. Um, among some of the equipment uh, that people buy, there is a rain gauge uh, that of course measures the amount of rain you're getting, the moisture meter you put in the soil, and then a hose timer for a drip irrigation. Uh, all of these things are relatively inexpensive um, and very useful. Uh, some of the don'ts, uh, people say don't use overhead sprinkling. I always used to. I just had one of those things that goes back and forth and back and forth, watered the whole garden, you know, half hour walk away from it. But it's, uh, it's not advised because uh, it's inefficient. The water evaporates, so it increases your water bill greatly, and it's just not particularly good for the plant unless you're trying to hose off pests or something like that. Uh, one Excuse thing me, is, Michael. Go ahead. Uh, we have a question about using the drip irrigation system. How can you tell how much water has been given? Therese wants to know that. Well, it depends on where you put it. I mean, I have one of one of the gardens that I water is, you know, I sort of put it on the top. And when I see it running out down below, that's enough. That's enough. I mean, you can check with your finger, uh, you know, get a trowel out. But I think, I think it's, um, you know, I, I, never water any one place with a drip hose more than half an hour. I might go 20 minutes uh, depending on the, the ground conditions uh, and all that sort of thing. So it's, um, you know, those are, that, that, that 20 minutes would be about maximum. Uh, also condition, you know, soil conditions, of course, uh, if you have sandy soil, uh, the water runs through sand very quickly. And uh, I don't need to ask how many of you have clay in your soil because everyone does. Uh, and of course that maintains, maintains the water more. You dig down six, eight inches and around my house and you could build a brick outhouse next to it because there's so much clay. Um, <clears throat> the, um, uh, oh, the hose in the sun. Uh, I, I read one item that said that you shouldn't, if your hose is, like mine, lying on the ground and exposed to uh, direct sun, don't, don't water from it right away because the water that comes out would be probably too, too, too hot to bathe in too, and the plant's not gonna like it as well. Uh, once again, the pistol grip is, it just gives, uh, it's hard to regulate that to not, to not mow down your plants. Um, <clears throat> and then overwatering encourages various kinds of, uh, of funguses. And I have, I mean, they're just, there's so many funguses that grow in this area. I made a, I made a list of them that um, I, I wouldn't be able to recognize them myself, but I'm sure that uh, there are experts who can. Um, of course, everybody knows downy mildew, frog eye leaf spot, white spot, bacterial soft rot, anthracnose, bottom rot, damping off, and black legs. So they're just all kinds of ways that you can damage the plant through fungus, funguses through overwatering. Next slide. Um, this is a chart that comes out of the Old Farmer's Almanac, which I found to be quite interesting. I hadn't seen it before, but looked this up recently. 
uh, critical times to water and number of gallons for summer vegetables. And it, it um, has, you know, it's got a color code up there. So um, this would be a kind of a good general guide, of course, there are conditions different, microclimates and wherever you might be, uh, high in the hills or down, down in the valley. Uh, but cabbage, for instance, uh, requires more water. Um, and, um, you know, the blue, the blue ones like Brussels sprouts, I don't know anyone who grows Brussels sprouts, but my wife likes them. Uh, broccoli, <clears throat> less water. So that's the, that's the first part. And then go ahead to the next slide is the second part of this, uh, you know, radishes, squash, tomatoes, and they all have their um, individual uh, needs. Uh, the, um, I guess that's basically it. Uh, oh, temporary droop. I was going to say this because I, I see this frequently in my yard. We have plants that probably shouldn't be out in the direct sun, but they're there anyway. Um, the people say that it's if the plant starts drooping in midday, if it then recovers later and later, it's not a good idea to to water that plant. I mean, if it's a question of life and death of the plant. Perhaps put a little water on it, but um, it, it um, the plant is just adapting to the direct sun conditions. So uh, you probably shouldn't water in the, in the, in the hot sun. Uh, next slide. Now these are some sources. Uh, that uh, the, um, the Old Farmer's Almanac is of course a book by itself. Um, I, found the, I, I found it excerpted um, in this article from Catherine Bookman, When to Water Your Vegetable Garden. Uh, and that had the watering guide in it. So that is it. Thank you. Okay. Next we have Allison. She's going to bug us. I will bug you indeed. Thank you, Karen and Michael. <laughs> so instead of talking about every possible insect out there, I thought I would walk you through the process that I went through just about a week ago on some of my vegetables in my garden, just so you can kind of get an idea of what what you can also do as the season continues and you see more insect damage. But before I talk about that process, I do want to point out that, as Karen mentioned, insects in your garden are mostly a good thing. They have a lot of beneficial roles for controlling other insects and being um, helping with pollination. You really do need them, and they will all be killed by insecticides, whether they're good or bad, or whether the insecticides are organic or not. So you really don't want to use anything unless the problem is really overwhelming. It's more about the overall numbers of insects, not so much the fact that they're there and they're doing a little bit of damage. Um, but with that, let's talk a little bit about my broccoli plants. So next slide, please. So I saw some holes in my, my broccoli plants um, last week and I noticed that they were more on the lower leaves, like something that's crawling out of the ground. And I saw that there was nothing I could see in the late afternoon when I was out there that I didn't see any particular insects. I was turning leaves over, I was looking around, and there was really nothing there. And so I got online and I literally Googled, you know, broccoli insects. And I also added that .edu extension because that gets you university sources and more evidence-based things. Uh, there's a lot of um, companies out there, a lot of people pushing products and solutions, but I find if you go straight to those scientific documents, you get better uh, resources. So I would re recommend that as you're looking for what you have. And so based on that research, it turned out a couple of things. It's probably going to be green cabbage worms or it's going to be green cabbage loopers, which are like these little green caterpillar things. So I was like, okay, that's what I'm going to find. I know what I'm looking for. And um, so the next morning I went out, early in the morning this time, and I didn't see any pretty green anything. All I saw were these little brown blobs on the leaf that looked like something that a caterpillar might leave behind. It didn't even look like an insect from what I could tell. So I took one off and I put it on a piece of white paper and I took a picture with my phone and I kind of blew it up so that I could see uh, what it was. And I was going to put it in an, an app to help me identify it, but then I didn't need to. So you'll see on the next slide uh, why. Next slide. It was just a slug. It was just a teeny tiny itty bitty slug. And I didn't even know that until I blew it up and could see this little body there. Um, so not a cabbage leaf or not a cabbage worm, um, just good old fashioned slugs. So I went back to those university resources to try to figure out, okay, what do you do if you have slugs? 
And the basic answer for these is you handpick them as much as you can. You can drown them in soapy water. I happen to have pretty heavy wood mulch around the broccoli plants, which apparently helps grow slugs, who knew? So that's something that I learned. I thought I was doing a good thing keeping those weeds down, but oh no, I was encouraging slugs. You can also put diatomaceous earth, crushed eggshells, you can drown them in beer. Uh, you can put little cups of beer that are buried down in the soil where the top of the cup is level with the ground and they will actually be attracted to it. They'll fall in and drown. So that's another option. I decided not to go with like the diatomaceous earth and those kind of things because those will also kill beneficial insects. And it really wasn't a big enough problem. I thought I could probably just remove them by hand and it would be fine. Um, so that is what I did. And I also moved the mulch away again. So I think um, my little broccoli example, my slug example, I think the take home message here is to clearly identify what you have. So you don't just go randomly treating insect damage in your garden. Like Karen mentioned, make sure you know what you've got. Um, help, if you need help knowing what you've got, if it doesn't match things that are on the, the brochures that say uh, this is what it's gonna be. Uh, there are different apps and websites that can help. There's one called iNaturalist that's put out by National Geographic and it's an app on the phone. You take a picture and it, it runs through some likely uh, matches. I find that pretty helpful. Other people have others, but um, so find out what you have. That's lesson number one. Number two is to use um, evidence-based methods to control them. And then number three is only treat if you absolutely have to. In my case, my broccoli is doing fine. The lower leaves are still ugly, but the plants are still growing and producing, so it all is well. Um, but I sure didn't want to get in there and wipe out a bunch of stuff without knowing what I had. Um, and that is, that's it on the broccoli example. Next slide. And these are the resources that I use. So I looked at uh, Clemson, their extension, and also our Virginia Cooperative Extension has tons and tons of great resources. I also recommend our fairfaxgardening.org website it has a lot of good stuff about pest management as well. And that's it for me. Okay. Ah, oh, nice picture. Okay. Um, Teresa has a question very quickly, um, Allison, about slugs. She says she heard that slugs don't like copper. Do you think a copper wire ring around the stem of a plant might deter them? No, I've heard that too. I haven't tried it. Certainly if you have some copper wire and want to give it a go, I think that's definitely better than starting to spread lots of pesticides. So I don't know, it's a good question. I hadn't heard that. Has anybody else tried that? I haven't. Yeah, I've tried the beer trick and that does work. It catches all those big slugs. And if you have some, you know, old bad beer left from a party or something, it's not a bad way to get rid of it. But um, I haven't tried copper, so thank you for bringing that up. Oh, Teresa says she has copper, so she has it around. Well, even better, you don't have to go find it. So yeah, for sure, give it a shot and uh, see if it works. 